Hello, guys. I hope everybody can hear me and see me fine. So uh, my name is Vladimir Tomko. I'm the CEO and game producer of a, a game called Blockchain Cuties Universe. And uh, today we will speak about uh, about blockchain gaming economies. So uh, we are one of the first companies uh, on the market uh, that uh, basically entered the crypto gaming space in early 2018. And this is what I call the first wave of crypto games. There were actually hundreds of them back at the beginning, but as of right now, only three survived. It's uh, CryptoKitties, the guys who started it all, us and Axie Infinity. So uh, roughly we've been 2.5 years on the market and uh, we did learn a lot in terms of gaming economies, in terms of the mistakes that you shouldn't do while doing a crypto game. And basically uh, we did uh, gather a lot of knowledge about how this market works the hard way because we did pioneer a lot. So uh, what's our game is about? Uh, our game is a crypto collectible game where you get to uh, breed and collect cute animals, different type of animals. So every person can find something that they like. And this game has a lot of RPG and strategy elements to it, meaning that each player can have more than one cutie, uh, even more than tens of hundreds and thousands of cuties. Uh, and uh, each such cutie can be equipped with different type of artifacts, like in uh, classical RPG games or rogue games like Diablo 2. So uh, our course here is to uh, transform the, uh, the game from current state where it is uh, crypto collectible into a more robust strategy game. And we've been doing it for a uh, year and a half already. So uh, our game is the only one uh, on the market that successfully runs on five different chains. It's Ethereum, EOS, Tron, Neo, and Matic. And uh, we uh, pursued a strategy of uh, joining the chain at the very beginning. So we choose the way of pioneers and always uh, struggled with things uh, when ecosystem isn't ready yet. We are always the thirst. And that's why we also are able to gather uh, knowledge from the thirst hands of not just how it all works right now, but how it all evolved to be. So um, I do believe that majority of people who are uh, listening uh, this session already know what crypto games are. But for those of uh, you who don't know, here's like a quick uh, intro. So blockchain games or crypto games versus regular games. Uh, what's the difference? The main difference is that it is possible to earn cryptocurrency by playing blockchain games. It is uh, a factor that we call play to earn, where you monetize uh, your time playing uh, and investing some funds into the game. Um, and if you do it correctly, it might provide some returns. Uh, the key word here is possible to earn cryptocurrency because not every player earns cryptocurrency while playing the game. And uh, the amount and types of players who do earn uh, vary a lot from gaming economy present in one or another game. Then another important thing is that uh, in blockchain games, you do you usually own your own asset. They are usually presented by non-fungible tokens or as we call them NFTs on the blockchain. It's not attributed to every game on the market uh, out there, but it does apply to the majority of them. And a uh, third very important thing is that almost every blockchain game has an open market, not a black one, but uh, an allowed one where people who participate in the game can trade their goods. And this market can be either first party, meaning inside the game, or third party market where liquid assets are traded against uh, other cryptocurrencies or each other. So. Uh, when we know what are blockchain games uh, in general, uh, we need to understand who play those types of game, who plays them and why. So uh, despite the fact that market has been around for uh, almost three years, it's going to be three years in November, 
the audience practically didn't change. It's uh, mostly males. 85% of people who play this type of games are males of age 25, 45, and they do that from all over the world. Uh, they are financially uh, literate people who are usually very good into finance or into crypto. And uh, the loyal audience um, usually know how to create gaming economies better than majority of developers that come from the regular gaming space because they've been doing it as a hobby or as a profession for majority of their life. Uh, another uh, segment that is new that uh, entered the blockchain gaming space uh, in somewhere middle of 2019 is high yield investment project users, people who play Ponzi schemes or pyramid type of games uh, using fiat money, uh, the legal ones that basically declare that this Ponzi scheme is going to exist for one month and here's the curve of how, how everything going to evolve and you either take the risk and try to play the game and earn the money or you just skip, the, skip them altogether. And the thing is that majority of those players, they're not familiar with crypto, but uh, they are okay to uh, play this type of games and to learn because uh, the outcome is similar. They either lose or earn money. Um, another very interesting thing is that, I don't know, like 80% of the audience who play crypto games, they are usually very good with Excel and Google Sheets and they, <clears throat> When they play, they invest their time, they calculate your economy, they try to understand what works, what doesn't work, not just by uh, the look and feel of it, but by calculations, because they want to put in their time effectively. And um, there are uh, many reasons to play blockchain games, and if to put them in uh, priorities, then the first one is people play blockchain games, not because it's fun, or they would like to receive emotions, but because it allows them to make profit by playing or trading. And this is uh, also the most important thing in terms of uh, retention. They do return to your game because it's not fun, but because they can make money by playing it. So uh, in the end, if you look at any blockchain game, the most important thing in your game is economy because the audience that does play this game, uh, they, uh, come to your game because they can make money there. So there are two economy types in blockchain gaming. First one is zero sum economy. It means that nothing free, each asset generation or meaningful action or interaction with blockchain requires payments. And it means that everything in your game is backed by money. And the second type of economy is time-based economy where investing time into and there is no need to pay for everything, you just can invest your money and at some point it will prove to return in in trades, in profit, if you're good enough. And of course, there are hybrid models that mix both approaches for different types of content. So uh, let's look at the zero sum economy. The zero, zero sum economy um, is very harsh on user onboarding because uh, people need to make a payment either along the onboarding process or right after it. And if you try to onboard uh, non-crypto users, it's very difficult to uh, put everything together in this uh, quick tutorial to uh, somehow incentivize money before they see what the game is all about. But uh, this is basically the only uh, hard factor for, uh, for the whole economy type, others are pretty good. So uh, the asset devaluation, which is a scourge of majority of blockchain games out there, happens a lot slower or almost doesn't happen if the game is a zero sum economy because everything costs money to obtain and uh, people usually are not willing to sell for less than they bought for. Then uh, the markets um, are usually healthier in these games because uh, assets devalue slow and the usual use case like a uh, business model case for blockchain games is for developers to take a cut of uh, all the sales that's happening on the platform. And uh, if uh, your game has, uh, 
I mean, if the assets on your market have uh, good value and they trade for uh, good amounts of money, like $1 plus, then this cut is actually something meaningful, uh, which is opposite to the uh, time-based games where this cut can be like uh, tens of thousands of cent. So uh, healthier markets is uh, another point that's present to zero-sum economy games. Then very important factor is that zero-sum economy is resistant to botting because time alone doesn't translate to value. Regular botting techniques uh, usually require investments in this type of economy and botters, they don't like to invest. Uh, it is, uh, this type of economy is also tolerant to different spending power. Um, it uh, means that people say that play in United Kingdom or United States, they do usually value their money, their time uh, in terms of more money because uh, the level of living uh, usually is higher in those countries and people understand how much money they earn by just like doing work. While people from uh, poorer countries like uh, like uh, Pakistan, for example, they are okay to settle for less money for their time. For their time, and um, usually, when uh, something can be obtained by just inputting some amounts of money, then people from poor countries are okay to sell it for less. And this doesn't happen in zero-sum economies uh, because uh, each asset is backed by initial investment, and nobody. Uh, wants to sell it uh, for cheaper. They can, but it's not something that they want. And uh, another great thing is that um, the retention rate after the initial conversion in zero-sum economy games is a lot higher because people understand that they've already inputted input some money and um, now they at least have an impulse to understand what's happening inside the game, how to uh, at least make the same amount of money back by playing, uh, which is not present in um, the second type of economy, which we'll talk right now. So time-based economy. Uh, the good thing is that it is easier to onboard new users because users are more accustomed to, to try the game for free and convert later if they decide to, if they like the game. And serviceable, obtainable market is a lot, like hundreds times bigger for uh, time-based economy blockchain games than it is for zero-sum economy games because you can onboard players that are not familiar with crypto, try to educate them and uh, at the end uh, convert them to crypto users that pay in crypto. Um, then the bad things. The asset devaluation is always happening because people get asset by playing or by grinding. Their value decreases uh, as more and more players get the same uh, or similar type of assets over time. Uh, it is harder to maintain effective markets because uh, the whole trade is usually happens within a corridor and uh, the real value is decided by the lower portion of the corridor. So if people are okay to sell their assets for pennies, then uh, the whole trade will go for pennies uh, on majority of assets. And if you happen to take some commission from the trade, you will also earn pennies by that. And uh, one of the worst things uh, in this type of economy is it's prone to botting. So time translates into value, meaning botting is somewhat profitable and botters always decrease asset scarcity and try to sell them cheaper than the market because when they write bots, bots, uh, money, uh, bots time doesn't cost any money. They can replicate to hundreds and thousands of bots. If you don't fight them, then they can just dump your economy in no time. It's also defenseless uh, to different spending power. As uh, I've talked earlier, people from UK and Pakistan do value their time differently. And uh, if you have a lot of users or uh, very active users from Pakistan, then they will sell for less and the whole market will also lower uh, to the least expensive prices. Uh, and um, the thing that is uh, attributed only to this type of market is that players need to be very active to earn money. Because of constant asset devaluation, players always need to translate their time into newer, more powerful and scarcer assets to be able to sell them for higher prices while they are still uh, on the topper edge of the curve. Uh, and uh, as time goes, they will become cheaper and cheaper. So only active players earn money. So there are hybrid models and there are actually not, not, not a single hybrid model, but many of those. 
And um, here are three of the most popular right now. So restrictions of free actions. Uh, time translates into value only to a certain extent, which uh, each player must go through, and everything above requires investment. This is something that my crypto heroes uh, did in their uh, initial launch of the game, uh, second version of the game. And it proved to be very effective because players are able to try it out, to test, to see how everything works, but they aren't able to basically uh, get everything that the big guys do get uh, without paying money. Uh, then uh, another good thing is the sandbox mod. It, each game mechanic has a sandbox mod, uh, something that shows the player how everything works. Uh, but it doesn't uh, allow to unlock its uh, its full potential. So everything that player got for free cannot be sold or requires a payment to unlock this option. Uh, My Crypto Heroes also did that. We in Blockchain Cuties uh, implement that. For example, uh, we do provide uh, uh, during seasonal events a lot of items that are personal, that are player bound. So they can use them. Uh, they can uh, use them to help grind other items, but they cannot sell them until they pay for season pass or um, or just like uh, pay the ability to sell the items. And uh, another thing is scalable burn of free assets. Uh, this is something that we are introducing hopefully today or tomorrow. And what it does is introduces systems that burn existing assets to provide new level of value, which uh, mar makes market healthier. Asset burn uh, requirements are calculated based on actual uh, in-game economical situation and are usually aimed towards creating demands for all type of sets. And when this burn is happening, or if it's not a burn, but a conversion of several different assets into one, uh, then this uh, new one initial assets uh, receives uh, the combined value, uh, devaluated, but combined value of all the assets that were used to create them and all the time that was used to put into uh, creation of this asset. So uh, those are the basics. Uh, and uh, I do believe that we will see more and more new uh, blockchain game economies presented into the game as time goes by, especially right now when DeFi uh, projects are on the hype and everybody is trying to participate in them. I do think that we will see more and more games that try to implement similar mechanics in them. But right now, let's. Uh, talk about specifics and things to consider and why sustaining a blockchain game might not be that easy as it seems from the first side. So you do need to understand that market is global. Running a game on public blockchain like Ethereum places your product on the same conditions as everyone else. And um, blockchain gaming market is a part of global crypto market, not just gaming market, which, which uh, moves very, very fast. And it is very easy to become outdated. If your game is something that CryptoKitties offered in November 2017, then nobody would play it right now because uh, there are newer things uh, that are available on the market and newer things that allow people who are into crypto market to make money by participating in decentralized applications. You need to try to use those uh, and always evolve. Then a uh, market uh, where you operate has a huge power over your, your product unless you are a trendsetter. Meaning that uh, if you're big enough and you invent things that everybody else copy, then you're on the wave writing it. But if you're not, if there are like more successful and bigger projects that present some value to the market, then you need to uh, try to tackle them down and implement those things into your project because uh, otherwise you'll become outdated. And uh, another very, very important thing to consider is because if we take an example of Ethereum market is global, net when network fees gets crazy high, like there are right now, 7, 17, 35 USD do uh, US dollars per transaction, uh, it will influence your business without taking into account how good your economy is. Uh, this thing, for example, happened to my crypto heroes. They had a game, they have a game on uh, Ethereum. The game has very good economy, one of the best on the market, but it's on Ethereum. And when this DeFi craze started to hit up, uh, the transactions became too expensive to play the game. There are assets that are being sold for $7, $17 in my crypto heroes and even less. 
And what we see on that router that like nine tenths of uh, audience is not playing the game anymore, at least for right now. And this impacts the sales and the business model of uh, my crypto heroes uh, developer. So you need to take that into account. It is very, very um, sad situation, but this is what's inside the market that we operate. Then bots destroy economies. Uh, easy as that, there are two types of bots in blockchain games, trading bots and grinding bots. And bots are, uh, both types of bots are bad for your economy. But trading bots are somewhat more tolerable. Uh, what they do is they try to make profit by doing automated and fast sales on the market. Uh, and uh, um, they, they usually get best uh, offers on the market and they're able to sell faster. Uh, and that's bad, but uh, they can't do that all the time, especially if they don't have the assets to sell that you as a player might have. But grinding bots are very bad because they generate value out of nothing as no real humans invest their time into this. Grinding bots can scale fast and this is the worst. And you must eliminate those as soon as you spot them. Uh, because if you want, they will dump your market and uh, uh, amount of time and money you've put into development will just uh, go away. Uh, then values of value of asset. Each asset have value and use cases and each use case has a corridor of market value, mostly defined by its lower end. Assets of the same use case strongly influence each other market value, meaning if you have a sword plus four and a sword plus five, and sword plus five is very rare, while the abundance of sword plus four grows, then the sword plus five uh, in terms of global value might also decrease because it can be easily uh, changed for sword plus four in majority of use cases. Uh, and assets of adjacent use cases also influence the price of each other. For example, you have this word plus four, uh, which is rare uh, and it provides four attack. And you also introduce a new shield to the game, which has uh, plus three attack on the shield. And this shield is very popular, it's easy to get. So it will also influence the use case of that sword because uh, they apply to the same uh, context of use. And uh, the whole market basically is, uh, graph of interconnected assets that change their weights over time. And pure collectible assets uh, that are not tied to use cases sustain their initial value better. Uh, for example, if you have, I don't know, like a dog that does nothing but looks good and you're able to, uh, to provide some like uh, personal value for people who buy them because it's, uh, uh, remind, reminds them of uh, some popular dogs like Doge, for example, then this is at one decrease in value because it's not tied to the context of use cases. It's just a great asset. And uh, I always advise to make uh, some portion of assets in your game not tied to your in-game economy, just personal assets that uh, tied to uh, subjective feelings of a person who buys them. Then, uh, uh, regulations and decentralization. Market won't regulate itself until it gets very big. You need to be the regulator or players who are okay to earn pennies will regulate the market for you. Uh, majority of players don't care whether your game is around tomorrow. They play short and they want to make profit today. You need to keep that in mind. Decentralization ideals may hinder your economical progress. And this is what we've encountered on our own experience. You must always remember that everything you do must bring you closer towards your goal, creation of a strong in-game economy. And players will always ask for things that will profit them today or the next week. Uh, they uh, rarely see the big picture. Monitor your markets. It's very easy to dump the market and very hard to restore it. And we did it twice. Uh, you need to, and to always monitor what's happening and uh, you need to react as fast as possible. If you see that some important asset drops in value, investigate why and try to slow its drop rate. If you see something rises, try to understand why and try to replicate this method to other assets or at least help this one grow. Look around and be collaborative. Uh, markets change very fast and implementation of new trends often helps to grow fast. Not every team is capable of quickly implementing those new trends into game uh, as game mechanics. 
And especially if you have a lot of issues in your game, you're like looking only in heads up display. You see only what's happening inside the game. You don't see the whole picture, the whole market and how it moves, but some teams do. So uh, usually I advise to do quick and cheap experiments within the game to see if they catch traction. If they uh, do catch traction, implement them as game mechanics. As an example, uh, we are implementing tournaments uh, this week. And before that, we just uh, did them in a sort of pen and paper style, asking players to participate and did free iterations of them manually to understand that we have demand. It didn't cost us any development time, uh, but we see that it got, got traction and now we're implementing it as a normal mechanic inside the game. And another advice is to try to collaborate with other projects that implement new trends to see if those uh, trends can help your product. If you do a collaboration, you do a co-sale, co-marketing campaign, you usually share some data, what's happening, how it helps you, what are the numbers. If you see that it fits your uh, needs, uh, then just try to replicate it and maybe do another uh, collaboration with that ex same exact company uh, to help you out on that. Don't make everything in your game as an NFT. If all your assets are non-fungible tokens, you have very little control uh, in terms of market restrictions, as everything can be traded on secondary market or transferred from one wallet to another without you being in the middle. Make some important assets tied to your market only. For example, we have items. Those are not blockchain uh, assets, but the trade goes through the blockchain. Each uh, trade is signed by the server and by the player on the blockchain. But people who want to trade items need to do that in our game. And that's why we have like some control over what's happening inside the market. Uh, this also helps uh, you to retain all players who are uh, leaving the game or decided to leave long time ago because they usually have some uh, assets in the game and they need to sell it and they can't usually sell it all at once. It's uh, an iterations. Uh, it's, it, it consists of iterations of uh, events and uh, basically they need to come back to your game to sell them and when they do they get exposed to your new updates uh, new ads and so on so there's a chance to retain them another thing to consider is is that players don't like change when you change something in a big way even if it's good for your game economy and for them players in the long run majority of people will react in a negative way this might impact your sales and you need to prepare for that there are people who've calculated the most effective ways of playing your game according to current situation and invested in those uh, particular contexts. Uh, they will be the most vocal protesters during the change because you will strip them off of their profit scheme. Uh, but you need to do that anyways if you are to improve the economy. And I also suggest to make smaller changes often than bigger uh, uh, in a more bigger periods of time. And the last advice is adaptation. Around 30% of success comes from your effort and 70% comes from the market. Market decides what's popular and in demand right now and what's not. It's not your game, only if you're a trendsetter. And you need to be ready to adapt to new ways and mechanics each time a new global market trend emerges. Even if those game mechanics uh, are not game mechanics at the very beginning at all and not uh, even coming from gaming industry. You just need to see what works, uh, to see why it works and try to implement it while it works. And uh, the main advice here is to adapt, to survive and hopefully thrive. Uh, thank you for your attention. Um, I see some questions in the chat. I will go through them very quickly. Can you recommend any tools for in-game economy balancing? Uh, yes, uh, because you are the people who are doing the economy. You just need to have one big spreadsheet or several big spreadsheets tied together. We use uh, Google Sheets for that mostly. Do you recommend being first mover in new chains? Uh, I would recommend that in 2018, 2019. Right now, it's not that easy. Uh, but still, for example, our recent release with Matic did provide a lot of uh, traction, a lot of new users and some new money. But uh, you need to understand that each chain that you add to the game slows down your game development progress because you need to support those uh, chains. Uh, so each new game update should be supported uh, on every chain that you have in the game. We have five right now. So we are 
in some regards, five times slower than different game developers. Uh, we are going to blockchain encrypt all items for sale trade in our uh, MMORPG. Are these challenges that you encountered would uh, you would recommend we do or not do to accomplish this? Um, well, the thing is that uh, I've seen this example done by, I think it was either Crypto Dragons, like some sort of Dragons game. Uh, there were like five in 2018. They did some sale uh, where they've, uh, I believe, encrypted loot boxes. Everything was on uh, on blockchain. And uh, they did pack a lot of assets from different games into there, but it uh, unfortunately didn't get any traction. The thing is that... Uh, uh, encryption of all items uh, inside um, inside a sale doesn't bring any particular value uh, mm -hmm. itself. Uh, what brings is basically the value of items, uh, the hype that you can build around your game, the prospects of economy that you can advertise on your players, not just the items uh, uh, that are going to be encrypted. So uh, I suggest you go with the trade as everybody else goes because uh, this definitely works and you don't have to invest time and money uh, into uh, development of specific encryption during the sale because uh, the prospects of it are uh, not very clear. I wouldn't do that at least in my, uh, if I were you. Uh, what's the future of blockchain gaming in case if none of the leading studios publishers won't back it up? Any plans, attempts to interact with it, uh, yeah, interact it with Steam, Epic, other leading distribution services? So uh, it's already happening. Um, there are big players who are backing uh, blockchain gaming space right now. Uh, so CryptoKitties development, Dapper Labs are doing their own new blockchain called Flow, and they already have contracts with UFC and NBA, and NBA, I believe, Hot Shot or NBA Shot uh, game is going to be released pretty soon. So we already did a collaboration with Tron and Samsung, and Blockchain Cuties was the first game that was advertised uh, and featured by Samsung uh, in their United States Galaxy Store for three weeks. So we did get some traction and we get some good media attention during that. Then um, there is, uh, I believe, Leonard from uh, Ubisoft is also leading this space. Uh, there is a company, like not a company, Alliance called Blockchain Game Alliance, where a lot of bigger players are in and they help each other and Ubisoft is inside them. So there are projects that are, if I recall correctly, backed by Ubisoft. So they're heavily, not heavily, but they're like sort of invested into this space and they do believe that it's going to happen. Then Blancos by the uh, Mythical Games uh, is also probably going to be released either this year or beginning the next year. And it's going to have a different approach. So right now, we are all targeting crypto related users and they are going to hide the blockchain and all the underlying stuff under the hood and make it look as a regular game, but with a set ownership that players will discover later on. So the things uh, um, for the, uh, the thing is that it is already good for the market. We already have some attention, some big investment firms are uh, coming in. So um, it's, it's happening, and uh, I think it's a matter, a uh, matter of maybe three, four years, while it gets uh, more and more broader um, adoption. But it is happening slower than I initially anticipated. I thought that in 2020, 2021, uh, we're we're going to have a lot more people in the space. Uh, than we had in 2017, but we saw a decline in 2018, a little bit uh, uh, on ramp during 2019, and now it's getting, getting better, especially right now with the hype, uh, because DeFi is growing and it uh, the uh, prospects of earning uh, thousands of dollars out of nothing uh, attracts a lot of people who aren't into blockchain, and we probably will see the similar growth as we saw in late 2017, early 2018. So things are already happening. Um, I don't. Um, I, I heard that there were plans to uh, 
to interact with uh, uh, Wargaming. They weren't very interested back in 2019. And Steam, uh, I think, is very comfortable with the current state of things because uh, there are big companies and blockchain space isn't regulated yet. There are a lot of uh, like uh, black money on the market, uh, people who didn't pass KYC and anti-money laundering uh, procedures. So uh, when you're a very big company, it's pretty like um, pretty hard to deal with the legal stuff when you do that. So I think they will join when the uh, legal thing is better on the market. Why did you not select Bitcoin as a current, uh, currency to incorporate? Uh, well, uh, we will uh, implement it, but the thing is that it requires some proxy uh, things um, inside uh, the protocols because uh, Bitcoin doesn't support smart contracts. It is easier to operate with currencies that can uh, both uh, be used, not just as a transaction that is converted to something, but like as a native currency inside the smart contracts. So that's why we only use tokens and currencies that work with smart contracts as of right now. Okay, guys, thank you. I've answered all the questions. Um, if you have any more, write me in Pine. Uh, we will speak uh, probably privately. Thank you very much. Bye.